Our Old Testament reading today is from Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophecy to these bones, and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh came upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal, and say to the breath, thus saith the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon those slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O oh, my people, and I shall bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and you bring you up from your, break, from your graves. O oh, my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. I will place you on your own soil, then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. I had a sermon series idea for this Lent this year that for a variety of reasons didn't work out. And I'm rather glad that it um, didn't because it caused us to kind of rely on the lectionary passages. The common lectionary is uh, a suggestion for texts to listen to. It's usually an Old Testament, a Psalm, a Gospel, and an Epistle. Um, the Ezekiel passage you just heard is uh, was the first one today and the second one from john's gospel is the second the gospel reading anyway these are parts of the bible that much of the global church together is listening to today which helps i think to increase our sense of solidarity so here it is uh, john's gospel chapter 11 it's a rather long uh, story Listen carefully, it's the word of God. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. 
Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, He was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there's a stench because he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone And Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what Jesus did, believed in him. 
This is the word of the Lord. Let us prepare. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word and silence in us any other voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the beginning, as the old, old story goes, the earth was, here's how it sounds in the original Hebrew, the earth was tohu vabohu, formless void is how it's usually translated into English. It's this kind of inky, nondescript darkness, uh, a big, hot soup of primal mess. Tohu va bohu. It's the original black hole. That's the origin of our existence. Total, complete chaos. But not for long, because God began to speak. And whenever God speaks, something happens, and it's always good. Light, sky, Land, sea, plants, animals, people. God spoke these things into existence. And whenever God is speaking, it's bound to be a recipe for goodness. And so I want you to hear these two things today on this fifth Sunday in Lent, in our global Lent that has everyone's attention. First, God does some of his very best work by speaking words of life and order directly into chaos. And secondly, God is yet speaking into this world he so deeply loves. John begins his gospel by saying that this word of God became flesh and took the form of Jesus. And as Jesus came into the world, he kept speaking the word of God. They were words that taught about the kingdom of God, words that proclaimed the goodness of God, words that healed the ravages of the human condition, demonstrating the ongoing reality that God does some of his best work in the midst of chaos. And through the word of God that is both spoken and embodied, that is to say, through the person of Jesus, there is a new creation. Tohu vabohu gives way to order and life. Well, Jesus, as we pick up this story, was just kind of going about his own business in and around Jerusalem doing the work for which he was sent into the world, teaching, preaching, healing, which also meant that he was getting kind of tangled up and in trouble with some of the religious leaders of the day, even some near-death trouble, when he got the news that his dear friend, perhaps actually his very best friend, was gravely ill. Now, I find it instructive to see what Jesus does and doesn't do in this crisis moment. For starters, he doesn't panic, as evidenced by the fact that he waited a full two days before going to Bethany. And any reading of the text gives no room to think that Jesus was indecisive, that he was agonizing over this decision, or that he was deterred by fear of losing his own life. Rather, what we see is Jesus behaving kind of nonchalantly, patient, just non-reactive. He doesn't get jerked around by death. You can almost see him yawning at the news of Lazarus being ill as if he's merely taking a nap. What is true about Jesus then is true about Jesus now. In moments of panic, I said that wrong, in moments of crisis, Jesus doesn't 
panic. But once he got there, I'm no less struck by what he did. I mean, instead of waving his hand and saying, stop your crying, stop the commotion, don't worry people, I'm here. Instead, he entered into their experience. He felt deep empathy toward others who were sad, and he accessed his own emotions as well. He entered into their grief. He wept with them. I don't know if there is another moment in the biblical narrative where we see the full humanity of Jesus converging with the full divinity of Jesus like here. He first enters into solidarity with the mourners, shedding his tears, accessing his feelings of sadness, even anger, and then he finds his voice. He speaks a resurrection word. Lazarus, come out. Lazarus came out, dead man walking. This has never happened before. This changes everything. God is here. And this is what he does in our day. When our otherwise, up to this point, oriented lives give way to disorientation, when we're no longer sure which way is up, when the ground underfoot feels shaky, unstable, Jesus enters the chaos and he speaks words of life that don't return us to our previous state of being, but rather orient us to a new way, a deeper and more profound and meaningful way of being in this world. I've been hearing this quite a bit lately, this language of, I can't wait till things get back to normal. I'm so looking forward to getting back to the way things were. I believe that may be a bit naive for us to think about our future that way. Even more importantly, I I don't believe God really wants us to return precisely to where we previously were. I mean, it would be uncharacteristic of God to not use a major global disorienting disruption to get our attention and to reorient our loves or affections. We sometimes hear about the phenomenon of a market correction. Uh, It's when stocks, as I understand it, are artificially high. Um, This bubble will eventually burst and the value of stocks will kind of come back down and get realigned with reality. It's very disruptive. It can also be quite disorienting. But just as there are corrections to market conditions in the economy, there are circumstances in life that serve to kind of wake us up, alerting us to the things we've been missing or overlooking or neglecting. Most of us have experienced a personal crisis of some kind that forces us to take stock to reevaluate what's really important and then to make some adjustments to our lifestyles so that we're better aligned with values that are godly, holy, There is a pile of evidence that these days that suggests ways we have lost our way, at least gotten off track, having lost sight of what is fundamentally important. There has been, up to this point, so much focus on power and wealth and control and pleasure that we've neglected some important things like the care of a vulnerable earth and the care of vulnerable people in our midst. We've lost sight of our mortality and of our need to invest in eternal life as citizens of the kingdom of God. Wouldn't it be a shame to go through all this pandemic hassle only to have everything go back to the way it was 
That's why I'm not praying for recovery. Because recovery only takes us back to where we once were before the crisis. No, I'm, I'm praying for healing. Healing ushers us into a new and a better place. We don't need recovery. We need healing. And fortunately, healing is what Jesus is all about. Friends, I hardly need to remind you that we find ourselves in a season of deep and profound disorientation. Our lives have been disrupted. Our assumptions about how life is supposed to be have been rearranged. Our jobs, our income, our schedules, our plans, even, unfortunately, some of our relationships. It's all been tossed up in the air and it hasn't yet landed on anything solid. It's a, it's a bit of a black hole, the chaos. We kind of feel it in our core. And with a future that is accompanied by uncertainty like we've never known before, there is considerable anxiety that wants to move in and feed off of it. That's to be expected. But I urge you to allow this season of disorientation to do its redemptive work of rearranging our hearts, our minds, our lifestyles. Reorientation, redemptive reorientation always takes time. So don't rush it. I'm at my temporary post today to tell you what I know to be true. It was true in the beginning, and it's true now. God does some of his very best work in the midst of chaos. From the beginning until now, God is the author of life, speaking with renewed, recreative energies. I know that Jesus is God's word in the flesh, and he is still itinerating around this old world still speaking words that rattle the powers of darkness and that startle the world with resurrection. When the valley is full of dry bones, when the stinking body has been in the tomb four days, in other words, when to our eyes things look altogether bleak and dire, Jesus can't even muster a modicum of panic because he's the word of God. He's got the words. He's using the words. And remember, whenever God speaks, it results in something good. As I've been trying to listen for those words these days, they sound something like this. Come out. Don't be afraid. Be still. I love you. I will never leave you. And then I've also been hearing this penetrating question. Do you believe this? If you say yes, then live like you believe it. The word will then become flesh in you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.